Hi friends, welcome on board for another project. This is an AC to DC power supply. It means the input voltage could be for example 220 volts AC and the output voltage in this case is 8 volts DC. It can handle up to 3 amps continuously. It means you can get up to 24 watts power from the output. The major difference between this design and similar ones is first this RM8 core and second is the output voltage which is 8 volts. Later on I will tell you why I selected, selected 8 volts for the output, not 5, 9, 12 or 12 volts, the traditional voltages. So it's a two layer PCB board, I designed the schematic and PCB using Altium Designer. So it was pretty easy to design such things using Altium Designer and shared the PCB with one of my friends who is an expert in power supply design using Altium 365. So I received his edits and guidance live on the cloud using Altium 365. Let me show you the bare PCB board. This is the bare PCB board without any components. So the fabrication quality is just perfect. I sense the Gerber's to PCB way and this is the results. Let's come back to the board and explain it. Let me keep it like this. Okay, I think it's fine. So here is the input voltage. This small uh, orange component is fuse, 500 milliamps fuse. This is MOV, capacitor for noise reduction. This is a common mode chalk and this is, the, this is a bridge rectifier, the capacitor for noise reduction. Here is the snubber circuit, this power resistor and this capacitor. This is the main controller and the main advantage of this controller is it doesn't need any auxiliary winding on the transformer and also even it doesn't need any external resistor for the power for the startup power. Here is the output, the shot kit diode, inductor, output inductor, the capacitors and here is the optocoupler to provide a feedback, feedback to the uh, controller and using this small potentiometer you can precisely adjust the output voltage and set it on 8 volts. And this one is an LED to indicate the proper output voltage. You can see the uh, isolation gaps on the back side. It's pretty clear on the back side. Anyway, I think I covered most of the points. In the next step, I will go through the schematic and PCB. Just stay tuned. Alright, here is the homepage of Altium Designer where you have access to all of these nice tutorials, also the learning center. Before I continue, I highly recommend you to not to use any cracked version of this software because your computer definitely will be infected with viruses and trojans. Also, you will face with some weird bugs in the software. So instead of that, just follow this link in my YouTube video description and activate your free, of course, free legal license. That allows you use a full version of this software with all of the features, of course, including Altium 365. So just don't forget that. Let's go to the schematic. This is the schematic diagram and this is the PCB layout, two layers PCB board. As you know, I explain everything in the article with full details and that include the schematic. So just follow this link in my YouTube video description and read the artic article because I skipped the schematic here. But before I go to the PCB, let's examine this component in the Octopart website. So here is the Octopart. Uh, as it says, uh, the part number is T, uh, TL431 and it is an adjustable voltage reference. The package is SOT, SOT23. Here is the inventory history 
and the manufacturer is NXP Semiconductor. This website, all of the features and services of this website is free, so I recommend you to bookmark this website and use it as a search engine for your electronic components and even the modules. Anyway, let's go to the PCB. As you know, I always emphasize that the true or correct placement of the components is the first golden rule in whatever PCB design for whatever circuit. That's why I put all of the mains related components on the left side and the output on the right side because the input and output are galvanically isolated. Let's go to the input. Here is the input connector for the mains. This is the fuse, this is the MOV, and this one is an AC rated capacitor for noise reduction and this common mode choke, as its name says for common mode, uh, common mode noise reduction. This is a bridge rectifier and this capacitor for ripple reduction. These two components belong to the snubber circuit and this is a controller. This is a very nice chip because if you remember, I told you it doesn't need any auxiliary winding on the transformer or even it doesn't need any startup resistor. Let's go to the output side. The reason why I put this polygon on the top and this blue, uh, this blue polygon on the bottom is to reduce the length of the ground pass and reduce the output noise. For the same reason, I put these wires in the critical areas. For example, near the ground pin of the decoupling capacitor, this cap capacitor, this one, and also below the inductor. Placing a ground plane below the inductor is a good practice to reduce the noise. Do you see near the ground pin of this capacitor? So all of these techniques, as I said, are to reduce the length of the ground pass. And for this circuit, the minimum benefit is to have uh, lower noise at the output. Final point is these creepage areas. When we deal with high voltages or mains, uh, AC mains input, it's a good practice to implement these creepage or isolation gaps to follow the IPC standards. So if you followed my circuit, I always put these uh, creepage areas when it's necessary. Anyway, in the next step, I will test the board. Stay tuned. All right, here is my test setup using oscilloscope, DC load, multimeter, and this is the power supply board which I have connected to the mains and this LED shows the proper operation of the board. I have set the output voltage to around 8 volts and I have connected the output to the DC load. So for the first test, I will measure the maximum voltage drop under the maximum load which is 3 amps. So I will apply 3 amps load to the output and I will measure the output voltage drop. But why I use this multimeter to measure the voltage? Because when I apply a 3 amps load to the output, these wires will introduce a voltage drop. And this uh, DC load reads the voltage from here. So I will use this multimeter to accurately measure the output voltage. So the first test is measuring the output voltage without any load. So this is the output voltage without any load, 8.056, okay? Now I, I apply the 3 amps load and turn this on. Look at this. So I can say under the worst condition, the voltage drop is just around 20 millivolts, not more. So this is a fantastic result for this power supply, just 20 millivolts voltage drop under the worst condition. For the next step, I will measure the output noise using the oscilloscope. So I will prepare the test and I will come back to you. 
Okay, to measure the output noise, I will perform two tests. First, I will measure the output noise under no load. And the second, I will measure the output noise under the maximum load, which is 3 amps. So I put the ground spring on the probe step to uh, minimize the external noises. So let me put the probe on the output. And there we go. This is the output noise under a no load. So it says around 5 millivolts RMS and around 13 millivolts peak to peak. Now I'm going to apply the maximum load to the output and measure the noise. So this is the 3 amps load. The out output noise is around 10 millivolts. RMS and around 50 millivolts peak to peak. Still a very good figure for this type of power supply indeed. And finally, this is my test setup to perform the load step response test. It means I will generate continuous current pulses using this DC load and I will examine the power supply output voltage for any instability and ringing. So using this Siglent CP4020 current probe is quite helpful and essential. First, to examine the current pulses and second, to use this current pulse as a trigger for the oscilloscope. Let me show you how this current probe works. If I apply one amp to the output, do you see? This is one amp. Anyway, let us let me go and generate this current pulse. So I set the low level of the current pulse to be 500 milliamps or half amp and the high level of the current pulse is 2.5 amps, 2.5 amps. Let me enable the DC load. Do you see that? This is the current pulse. Let me put the oscilloscope probe to the output. And there we go. A little bit loose. This is the output voltage of the power supply under this current pulses and I don't see any special instability and ringing. It means the power supply passes all of the test tests I performed here and I'm, I'm really happy with this power supply. In the next step I will tell you why I selected 8 volts for the output of this power supply. All right, now I should explain why I have selected eight volts for the output of this power supply. So you're gonna use a power supply to power a microcontroller or Arduino board or whatever. So this is the load. A microcontroller could be five volts, 3.3 volts uh, or 5 volts Arduino. So your selection point should not be a switching power supply with a 5 or 3.3 volts output because the output voltage of such power supplies are noisy. So if you consider this as a power supply, I wrote SMPS 220 volts to 8 volts, you should pass this voltage to a filter it could be LC, RC, or a Pi filter. Then you should use a linear regulator and then apply this voltage to your load. This shouldn't be from here to here. This is wrong, okay? So, for example, uh, if you want to drive an Arduino and your Arduino is 5 volts, then 8 volts from here, then, for example, use an LC filter here, then use a linear regulator with the five, uh, 5 volts output and then this will drive your Arduino board. So why 8 volts? Because linear regulators are very nice and uh, introduce low noise figures. However, they are not efficient. This is the only disadvantage of linear regulators. So providing 8 volts for the input of the linear regulator ensures that the heat dissipation from here is low. 
all right because the voltage difference from 8 volts in this case and 5 is just 3 volts and 3 volts covers almost all type type uh, types of linear regular regulators for example this one i think the voltage drop is around 2.5 and 3 volts and this is the worst case so even uh, 3 volts difference supports such a regulator so if you use low drop uh, linear regulator then the voltage difference is even lower than this maybe half volts in some cases so this ensures 8 volts ensures that your linear regulator is not under stress uh, thermally i mean it's not dissipating a lot of heat because uh, heat dissipation and thermal stress damages the linear, uh, linear regulator and also uh, in such cases the output voltage is not guaranteed in terms of stability however if you use 12 volts because there are a lot of switching power supplies in the market with 12 volts output or even 9 volts 12 and 5 introduce a higher voltage difference and you will see a lot of heat dissipation on your linear regulator so why not use this design and uh, uh, introduce circuits with higher performance and with lower heat dissipation and of course with smaller heat sinks for your circuit so that was all the points i hope you liked this video give me a big thumbs up see you in the next video